So we've seen a couple things at this point. We've actually seen quite a bit. You probably feel somewhat like you're drinking from a fire hose if you're going through this class. Uh, that's okay. It, we all have felt that way. You are kind of drinking from a fire hose. Uh, you'll get used to it. It's okay. So we've seen a couple things. We've seen the idea of a change in position, which we call a displacement. This is going to be some final position minus the initial position. The, the, uh, doing this with regards to time, of course, right, it's t final minus t initial. Uh, forming delta x over delta t led us to uh, the idea of a velocity. But then we said that the velocity can also change. And so I have the idea of a v final minus v initial. And doing this with regards to the time it takes to change it led us to the acceleration. And then we also said that the acceleration, of course, we can, you can form a delta on anything. We can talk about AF minus AI. So what, I'm gonna, what I want you to call your attention to is a, well, a couple of things. If something is not moving, let's look at this one. If the position of something is not changing, what that means is that XF minus X initial equals zero. Those are the same positions. If it's sitting at five meters from the origin, five meters minus five meters turns out to be zero, right? And so any of these could be zero. And so I'll say this as a general rule. If delta of whatever, whatever you want to put where the squiggly line is, x, t, v, a, whatever, if that equals zero, this means that whatever that is, is constant. Right. If delta A is equal to zero, that means that the final acceleration and the initial acceleration are the same. There's no change in acceleration, so A is constant. V could be constant, T could be constant, X could be constant. Although T being constant doesn't make a whole lot of sense because that's actually not, that doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on the physical universe. If T is constant, then you didn't look at it for any time at all, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. There is something we can do with delta t, though. We almost always, and this is a, an arbitrary choice, but we almost always start our stopwatches at zero. That is, we put our temporal origin such that t initial is almost always going to be zero. In fact, we do it so often, we typically don't even write a delta t. We typically just write a t. Whenever I write a t in these mechanical equations, what that actually means is a delta t, but I'm, in, I'm understanding that t initial is always going to be zero. You always have the power of when to click start your stopwatch. So almost always we're going to let t initial be zero and just write a t. We don't even have to write a t final at that point. It's just whatever time it is, whatever time I read off my stopwatch after I started it at zero, turns out to be t. The, the delta is implied, and sometimes I'll write it, sometimes I won't. But almost always, this just turns into a t. Okay, so just hang on to that. t initial is almost always zero. Okay, so in any physical system, any of this stuff could or could not be zero. Uh, specifically, let's look at the acceleration. The, ex the change in acceleration could be zero, it could not be zero. And of course, we can see that there are tons and tons and tons of real world applications in which the acceleration is not a constant. Uh, however, there is a very interesting subset of all of the possible states of motion you could be in for which the acceleration is constant. Uh, the main one I can think about is uh, we're in a gravitational field which is pulling us all downwards and maybe you learned at some point in a science class that the acceleration due to gravity is constant no matter how big or small the object is. Galileo's famous experiment where he dropped two stones off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Probably didn't actually do that. It's a, probably an apocryphal story, but it's kind of cool to think about because he noticed that they hit the ground at the same time, even though they were different sizes. That is a constant acceleration. So there's a whole set of interesting uh, physical systems for which the acceleration is constant. If I choose to only look at those systems, I can do some very, very interesting things. Two seconds. 
I can do some very, very interesting things with systems whose acceleration is constant. To show you what I mean, let's start off with a, a, a derivation of an equation. Now, you're not going to be required to reproduce this derivation. Uh, some of you have not been through Cal 1. I think some of you have probably not been through differential equations. You need all of that to do what I'm about to do. So it's not going to be required that you reproduce this, but I do want to show you what you can do with that, and then we're going to use the equation that we get out of it. So let me just start with how we defined the acceleration, the time rate of change of the velocity, the derivative, the time derivative of the velocity. If I start with this definition, if you understand a little bit of differential equations, I can do a process called separating the variables. It's going to look like I'm cross multiplying. <laughs> I promise I'm not. There's actually some pretty sophisticated machinery going on here, which I'll leave to your differential equations teachers to, to, to show you. But I'm going to separate the variables. I'm going to get uh, everything functionally involving V on one side of the equation and everything functionally involving T on another side of the equation. In this case, it's not so bad to do. I'm going to come up with dv is equal to a dt. Again, it looked like I cross-multiplied the differential. I promise you I didn't. There's other stuff going on. But once I have this in this form, once I've separated the variables, I've got velocity over here and time over here, I've got a differential element. Right? I took my derivative and I turned it into some differential elements. What can I do with differential elements? I can integrate them. So let me integrate both sides of this equation, integral of dv is equal to the integral of a dt. Now, these are going to be definite integrals. I need some limits. So I'm going to integrate dv over the range of v initial, whatever I'm doing when I start caring about the system, to v final, whatever I'm doing when I stop caring about the system. Similarly, I'm going to integrate dt over the time that it was when v initial occurred. Right, V initial happens at some T initial. V final happens at some T final. Now, according to what we just said, I'm probably at some point, and I'll do it after I integrate, let T initial equal zero. I can always start my stopwatch whenever I want to. So I'm gonna allow that to be zero, but I'm gonna integrate first and then, then we'll get rid of that. But what I wanna point out though, is that the assumption that we made, and this is an assumption, is that the acceleration was constant. If the acceleration is not constant, I'm kind of stuck here. Unless I know the functional form of the acceleration with respect to time, I can't integrate this. But if I assume that the acceleration is constant, it does not change, then I can pull that out of the integral. What I get on the left side, the integral of dv is just v, evaluated v initial to v final, is equal to a, Integral of dt is just t evaluated t final, t initial, evaluated at the limits. And what I get is v final minus v initial is equal to a t final minus t initial. Here's where I'm going to say, aha, I can, let my start, I can start my stopwatch whenever I want to. Let's simplify that by allowing that to be zero. And what I get, if I solve this equation for v final, I get v final is equal to v initial plus a t, where I'm leaving off the final subscript because, as I said a while ago, if this is zero, I don't have to subscript this. This is just whatever time my stopwatch reads when I decide to stop it. Now, if you've taken a physics class before, you've seen this equation. This is one of a set of equations called kinematic equations. Kinematic equations are very useful for analyzing motion without regards to anything that produces that motion. In other words, we're gonna learn later that accelerations are produced by what we call forces. But if we don't care about what produces an acceleration or what, what, is it, what was involved in instigating this motion, if we don't care about any of that, Kinematic equations are really useful for analyzing the motion of objects in terms of their velocity, accelerations, times, and later we'll see their positions. What, what you've got to realize here is that we got this expression, which is one of the kinematic equations, by assuming that acceleration is constant. 
Therefore, take this to the bank. If you are dealing with a physical system whose acceleration is not constant, you cannot use this expression. We're going to look at lots of systems whose acceleration is constant. We're going to look at lots of systems whose acceleration is not constant. Whether or not you can use this equation or any of the kinematic equations I'm about to show you is determined by the acceleration. Non-constant acceleration, forget about it. Constant acceleration, you can use these. No, not the, the, the most elegant way to solve problems, but they certainly work. So let me introduce you to the kinematic equations. Your book gives you five, which I think is curious. One of them is a special case of one of the other ones. There are really only four kinematic equations. Um, here's, here's the way I write it. As I mentioned in a previous video, my notation is going to be a little bit different from the book's notation, but that's okay. Here's how I write them. The first one we saw, V final, is equal to V initial plus A T. This equation relates velocity final and initial to the acceleration and the time over which you're looking at the system. This is uh, one of the equations. The next one, probably going to be a workhorse for you. X final is equal to X initial plus V initial T plus one half A T squared. We didn't derive this one. It is derivable, of course. But this equation relates uh, position, final and initial, to initial velocity, acceleration, and the time over which you're looking at the system. Notice the final velocity does not appear in this equation. So if you need to find the final velocity, you're probably not going to go to this equation. Just like if you need to find anything involving position, you're probably not going to go to this equation because this has no information about position. So one of, the, one of the skills with learning how to use the kinematic equations is learning which one to pick. And the answer is you just look at what you need and find an equation that has that stuff. All right. This is another one. V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2A delta X. So this relates final initial velocities to the acceleration and the displacement. Remember, inside delta X, you've got a final and initial velocity buried inside here. So they're there. I'm just not writing them out. The interesting thing about this equation, though, is that there's no time. So if you need to find an expression, if you need to find one of these quantities and you don't know time information, this is the one you want. If you don't care about position, this is the one. If you don't care about final velocity, this is the one. If you don't care about time, this is the one. This is, these are three of the kinematic equations. Um, there, you, you can write, there's another one which we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, in a later video. And your book gives you several variations of this. These three, are, I think, are the most useful. So these are the ones I typically focus on. So I'm going to leave this video with these three. We'll look at the other one in a later video. Uh, it, we'll just call it supplemental. It's useful. Uh, one thing I want to mention about the third equation, though, is we are squaring our velocity terms. So what happens to a negative number when you square it? It becomes a positive number. And remember what negatives tell you in physics, especially in mechanics. They tell you about directions. So with this one, you have to be careful because you're actually losing directional information here. You can treat this as, uh, as dealing with speeds, and, which is what we normally do because this is a speed. The final square turns out to be the, 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 the square of a speed because we're losing the vector information. And then use a picture or your intuition to figure out directions later. That's typically how we approach problems like this. But just be careful with this because you do, you do lose some information here. It can be a little unclear, so you have to be very careful with how you proceed uh, with this third one. All right, so in future videos, uh, in, in another supplemented video, I'll introduce you to the, the fourth equation, and we'll talk about that.